Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Well, this is Dr. Vande. Today's question asks if I can discuss the case of Sarah Marie Johnson. She was an individual who was convicted of a double parasite, which is an extremely rare type of murder. So she was a real person, so it's important to indicate here that I'm not diagnosing her but rather just speculating on what could have been going on in a situation like this. So first I'm going to go through the timeline in this case and then look at some of the mental health, personality, and human behavior aspects. After that I'm going to take a look briefly at the concept of juvenile parasite. Again, a rare type of crime and fairly interesting. So this case starts with really three people. Some other people were involved, but it mostly involves three people. Sarah Marie Johnson, who at the time in 2003 was 16 years old, her father Alan Johnson, who was 46 years old, and Diane Johnson, who was 52 years old. They lived in Bellevue, Idaho, and they had been married for 20 years. So we see the case really starts early on September 2nd, 2003. We see that Sarah Johnson runs out of her home screaming for help. She runs over to a neighbor's house and she says that her parents have just been murdered. When the police arrived, they found Diane Johnson, Sarah Johnson's mother, lying under the covers in her bed, and she was deceased, and most of her head was missing. They also found Alan Johnson lying next to the bed, apparently dead from a gunshot wound to the chest. It appears that Alan stepped out of the shower because he was still wet, so he stepped out of the shower, he was shot, and then managed to walk into the bedroom where he collapsed. Now in a trash can outside the Johnson's home, the police recovered a pink bathrobe and two gloves, a right-handed latex glove and a left-handed leather glove. Now inside the house they also found a great deal of evidence, including biological material, blood spatters and tissue and bone fragments that went from the Johnson's bedroom into the hallway and across into Sarah Johnson's bedroom. So. Sarah Johnson's bedroom was across from her parents' bedroom. They also recovered a weapon at the scene, a 264 Winchester Magnum rifle, which is a rifle that has quite a bit of recoil, and this plays a part later on in the trial. This was found in the master bedroom. The police also recovered two butcher knives, and the tips of these knives were touching, and they were placed at the end of the Johnson's bed. There was no evidence of forced entry into the house, but the house was never locked anyway, so that really didn't contribute much to the investigation. When Sarah first talked to the police, she gave several different stories, five different accounts actually. Now one of the key inconsistencies here was that she said that her room was closed, her bedroom door was closed, but they found biological evidence that it was not, I meaning they found DNA, blood splatter, and bone tissue in her room from the homicide. So it turns out her door must have been opened. Now this is just one inconsistency, but several were discovered in her story. She admitted that the pink robe belonged to her, but she denied knowing how it ended up in the trash can. And when the police first asked about the robe, the way Sarah responded was that she did not kill her parents. And the police found this to be kind of an interesting way to approach that question. So they found it odd. Now this is an interesting piece here because I find that police often do this in these type of cases. They look at the human behavior side and they say, well, it doesn't really fit based on what was going on. So her behavior may have been odd, but if her parents were just murdered and she wasn't the perpetrator, then it's hard to know how somebody should react. People react to stress in a lot of different ways. But of course, this was used against her in the trial later on. Now, the rifle I mentioned just a moment ago that was used to kill the Johnsons belonged to somebody that they rented a garage apartment to. His name was Mel Spiegel. He had an alibi. He was away from that area during the time of the murders. He did indicate, however, that it was his rifle and he kept it unlocked in his apartment and Sarah Johnson had access to that apartment. When the police interviewed the friends and neighbors, they tended to think that Sarah Johnson was infatuated with a 19-year-old boyfriend named Bruno Santos. So Bruno Santos became kind of a key suspect early on. These two had been dating for about three months before the murder of the Johnsons, and they did not approve of him for a variety of reasons. On August 29th, which was just a few days before the murders, 
Sarah told her parents she'd be spending the night with friends, but instead she spent the night with Bruno Santos. And when her parents found out, her father went to look for her the next day and confronted Santos and brought her home, and she was grounded from that point on. Now later on, according to a witness testimony, we found out that Sarah seemed to take this punishment pretty well, unusually well. Usually she'd be upset when something like this happened, and she didn't seem to be upset. So later on, when the police had an opportunity to analyze the evidence, there was DNA testing and other testing done that connected the robe to Sarah Johnson and the gloves to Sarah Johnson. Later on, they would also find a shower cap that had been flushed down the toilet. After this, Sarah Johnson was charged with first-degree murder. During her trial, there was a lot of testimony about Sarah Johnson's inappropriate behavior and how she tended to not have emotions that people thought fit the situation. She seemed to be more concerned with her boyfriend. She also didn't appear to be traumatized. And at her parents' funeral, she talked about how she wanted to play volleyball that night. Some other people also said that her sadness seemed to be superficial. Now, I think this is important because there's a few aspects here that a mental health professional might be able to detect, but a member of the general public might not be able to, but yet, of course, it's still admissible in court. For example, she did not seem traumatized. Well, what does somebody who's traumatized seem like? What does that look like? Also, what is superficial sadness? How would we define that? How would we know when somebody's being sad, but it's only really at the surface? So again, kind of how people appear after events like this, this is used against them, even if the person evaluating that behavior is not really qualified to comment on the nuances of that behavior. They're not really qualified to assess the person. So I think, of course, as I'll talk about later on, I think she was guilty of these crimes. But it's interesting how these pieces kind of come together. People look at somebody and they say, oh, they don't seem to be traumatized, or they seem to have superficial feelings. And again, that's used in testimony. In a similar way, we see that her brother testified against her and described her as dramatic, a good actress, and somebody who lied a lot. So there was a lot of people testifying against Sarah Johnson based on her behavior. So now in terms of the defense, I've talked about what the prosecution had to say. In terms of the defense, they noted that there was a lack of blood or tissue found on Sarah or her clothing. They didn't find anything in her hair, on her hands, or really anywhere. Now, the mother, Diane, was shot at close range, so really it would be impossible that the murderer wouldn't have been splattered with blood. So this became kind of a key part of the case for the defense. There were no fingerprints found on the cartridges, on the rifle, or those knives that were arranged that I talked about, but there was testimony from one of Sarah Johnson's cellmates. Usually I think of this type of testimony as extremely unreliable. It was admitted and probably didn't help her case, of course. She was found guilty on two counts of murder in the first degree. She was sentenced to two life terms, and she will not have the possibility of parole. And at this point, she's out of appeals. There were several appeals that took place, and she was unsuccessful. So that's the timeline in this case. This is an extremely interesting case. Sarah Johnson really almost got away with these murders, but they were poorly planned. For example, there was a garbage truck that would have picked up the trash where that evidence was. It was one house away when the police arrived. So she almost did get away with this parasite. Now we see that in terms of some of the case characteristics are interesting. Bruno Santos seemed like somebody the police should really investigate. There was a confrontation between him and the dad a few days before. I mentioned that. The police found him to be arrogant. He had a weak alibi. He had been in the house before and he refused to stop seeing Sarah Johnson even though the parents told him to stop. So he again seemed like a good candidate to consider for this murder but when they investigated him they found no evidence that he was involved. So then the case kind of turned toward Sarah Johnson and there was quite a bit of evidence that tied her to these murders. Now I've already talked about the physical evidence there was the robe and the gloves that were connected to her there was some bruising on her shoulder from the recoil of the rifle. She tried to explain it away, but it was linear in the way it was on her shoulder, and it did look like it came from the rifle. But in terms of behavioral evidence, this became kind of a key part in her case. It makes her case kind of interesting. Her inconsistencies, 
in terms of when she was interviewed by the police initially. And none of this looked good. This didn't go in her favor. So in terms of the mental health, personality, and human behavior perspective, again, just speculating on what could have been going on in a situation like this, we see that this type of case where you have a young female perpetrator committing a double parasite is exceedingly rare. Parasites are rare already when a male commits them. A female committing a parasite, particularly a juvenile female, this is something we just don't see. The mental health professionals that testified at a trial, and I'll get to their testimony in a minute, they said that she did have clinical depression and a suicide attempt, but no history of violence or crime. So again, double parasite just doesn't seem to fit in this case. Now I mentioned that parasites are exceedingly rare. About 2-4% to 4 of all homicides in Western countries are parasites, and about 2% of homicides in the United States are parasites. 90% of the perpetrators are male. When somebody kills both their father and their mother in a situation like that, it's almost always a male. So a parasitical female is very rare, especially a double parasite. If we look at about the last 25 years or so, there are fewer than five cases like this in the United States that I could find, and all of them involved abuse. And again, Sarah Johnson didn't appear to be abused. So there's been a lot of fascination and interest in this case because it's unusual. It may actually be really the only case of its type, again, in the last 25 years or maybe even more, in the United States. So now taking a closer look at the mental health piece. Two mental health professionals testified during the trial, really at the sentencing phase, and they really were talking about the hope that Sarah Johnson could be rehabilitated. And really they said similar things, right? So the first clinician said that Sarah Johnson had clinical depression for the two years preceding the murders, but showed no evidence of psychosis, conduct disorder, or antisocial personality disorder. And evidence of conduct disorder before the age of 15 is required for a diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder. But again, no evidence was available that supported either of those diagnoses. She did not appear to be prone to violence, and she was described as being fairly normal. Now, this clinician said that she was amenable to rehabilitation and thought it was very likely that if she was released someday, she would never commit another crime like this. Now, the next mental health professional who testified really found the same thing, except he appeared to have even a more positive image of the chances of rehabilitation. He indicated she had a high potential for successful rehabilitation. Looking at her mental health history and her personality characteristics, he concluded there would be a substantial likelihood that she could be reformed completely and not pose any danger to society. Now, interestingly, what he really added to this discussion was that she didn't need to accept responsibility at this point in order to be rehabilitated. So I guess he was kind of thinking that she wasn't confessing to the crimes at that point at sentencing, but maybe she would later on, and then that could facilitate her rehabilitation later on. So throughout this whole process through the trial, and even up till now, as far as I know, she's never accepted responsibility for these crimes. She still says that she's not guilty. So in weighing this testimony, the court concluded that rehabilitation in her case was possible, but there's certain conduct that crosses a line and somebody represents too much of a danger to society. So she was, again, sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. We see in her attempts to appeal that the main argument was that sentencing a child to die in prison constitutes cruel and unusual punishment. And many states have banned this practice, and other states are very careful about life sentences for minors. But either way, the court stayed with the original finding, and she's in prison for life. So what happened in the case of Sarah Johnson? Again, this is such an unusual case. What motivated her to commit these crimes? What caused this? Well, she was careful in her planning, so it, of course it did appear premeditated, but it also appeared to be driven by kind of an immature emotional reaction with the whole boyfriend thing that she was trying to move forward. She wanted to see the boyfriend, her parents wouldn't let her. It's hardly a reason to commit a heinous murder. Now it stands to reason that impulsivity may have played a part in these murders, positive urgency. This is when somebody has positive emotions and they can't resist the impulse to act on them. 
and also negative urgency because she didn't get along with her parents, so that could have contributed. I think there was probably a degree of fantasy, which is an unusual in people that are narcissistic. So it may have been that she had some narcissistic tendencies. I think she had fantasies potentially about money, the life insurance money, as well as, of course, a life with the boyfriend. Now, it was brought up at trial that she watched a lot of true crime TV, and that's where maybe she got the idea of how to use the robe and the gloves and try to make it look like she wasn't guilty. Now, that doesn't necessarily speak to why she did it, but it's interesting that maybe she kind of learned some of those tactics from television. Now, again, we've never seen a confession in this case, so we're really kind of left without knowing what really happened. We have little insight into her state of mind, and we're just left to speculate based on this restricted amount of evidence. So the last part I'll cover here is parasite. I'll talk about parasite and some of its characteristics. Again, I mentioned this was a double parasite committed by a juvenile female. Extremely rare event. We see that juvenile parasite is an extremely low base rate behavior to start with. And most of the time when we see juvenile parasite, it's because of abuse or it's connected to abuse in some way, meaning a child was abused and then they acted out. So they feel trapped, they feel like they can't get out of the situation and they have no other way to go, so they end up committing a murder. About 25% of the time, they will use an accomplice. Much of the time, juvenile parasitical offenders have little or no histories in terms of juvenile delinquency or violent behavior. And we also see they're not usually involved in mental health treatment, although some have had personality disorders. Juvenile parasitical offenders tend to kill in non-confrontational situations. So they kill the parent while the parent's back is churned or while they're sleeping or on a computer or something like that. So in this case, we kind of see this does connect to what happened. We see that Sarah Johnson shot her mother. Her mother was asleep at the time and then went toward the bathroom and entered the bathroom and shot her father. So we don't know if maybe she was trying to kill both of them really quickly without anybody knowing, without having to have some sort of confrontation. But when she walked into the room, I'm sure she could hear that the shower is running, so she must have known that she was going to kill the mother and then have to confront the father. So that was kind of another unusual part of this case. Of course, this case has a lot of unusual features. This idea that she confronted the father, he was standing up and awake and alert when he was shot. Now, we saw at the trial there was speculation that she must have communicated with the father in some way. There was this idea that there must have been some sort of short discussion that occurred. Maybe she said something to him or she heard something from him but we don't really know. She could have shot the mother and operated a bolt-action rifle and then shot the father just that quickly. So we don't really know if any communication occurred. Again, she didn't reveal any information about that. Now because of this element of this type of crime, shooting somebody when they're not looking or when they're sleeping, self-defense is a hard argument for juvenile parasitical offenders to make. And of course we see with Sarah Johnson, she goes through this elaborate process to make it look like somebody else committed the crime. We also see in parasites a lot of times a battered child syndrome is used as a defense, but again Sarah Johnson wasn't abused, so that couldn't be used either. So in terms of as a mental health community, what can we do about juvenile parasite, parasite in general, double parasite? Unfortunately there isn't much we can do. Juvenile parasite in particular is essentially impossible to predict, as are a lot of parasites. There is no way to predict something that has such a low base rate, especially because there's little history of delinquent behavior or violence. So it's tough to get in front of these types of cases and prevent them. We just don't know when they're going to happen or who's going to perpetrate them. On top of this, there are no risk assessment instruments that are currently available that can help us to predict juvenile parasite either. So we really have no tools to work with in terms of preventing this type of crime. Obviously, if somebody's working with a client and they say they're going to do this or there's some clear evidence, a counselor can act on that. But outside of that, we don't really get a lot of warning in these types of cases. So this is a very interesting case. As I mentioned, this is really one of the most rare types of murders that we see really anywhere. And I don't think this case really received a lot of attention, but it is pretty interesting. I think if Sarah Johnson had confessed and told her story that would have attracted a little bit more attention because we could have really 
received more information about maybe what she was thinking, but she didn't. So again, we're kind of cut off. We don't have a lot of information, and the case doesn't really generate a lot of interest now. So I know whenever I talk about these types of cases, like juveniles committing parasite and cases like this, there's going to be different opinions. If you agree or disagree with me or have other opinions, please put those in the comments. That always generates a really interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found this description of the Sarah Johnson murder case to be interesting. Thanks for watching.